Hallo en welkom terug naar de Jason Jubilee Conference, live van de Grote Kerk in Den Haag. Uh, well, before we had the coffee break, we mentioned the cartoon that's being made actually right now. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we could take a quick look on how the cartoon is a work in progress indeed. Uh, we will discuss this later uh, during the conference, but also at the end of the day. And also, please note the already made interesting cartoons that are made in, in advance of the panel. Speaking of panels, it is time to introduce our first panel on NATO in Africa, the human face of security. This panel comprises out of two parts. Uh, we have later on a panel with two experts, Sophia Ogbu and Miriam van Reijzen. Uh, but first, we kick off this panel by a speech by former Chief of Defense General Tom Middendorp. Tom Middendorp was the first top army officer in the Netherlands to openly discuss climate change as an accelerating variable in conflicts. It was back in 2016. Today he will reflect upon climate proofing NATO and how climate change is a threat multiplier on the continent. After his speech there will be some time for some Q&A so please do not hesitate to listen closely and and make sure we have some nice questions. But first, I'd like to give the floor to Tom Middendorp. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by congratulating Jason with its anniversary. And the fact that they are celebrating this anniversary, anniversary shows uh, how Jason has matured over time and has proven its added value in uniting the younger generation and creating uh, the awareness of our security and the importance of security. So I gratefully accepted the invitation to speak here to you today on a future challenge that all of us are facing, including NATO. And that's the challenge of our changing climate. Uh, when I first addressed this uh, four years ago as a chief of defense, it raised a lot of turmoil in the Netherlands with screaming headlines in the newspapers. Uh, it was the first time I really went viral on the social media because everybody was confused. What is this general talking about? What is he interfering with? Why is he in mingling into a subject that is not a security subject? Uh, our minister was called to parliament uh, and I, became, I gave, uh, was given the nickname of the Green General. Uh, and uh, that's a nickname that I bear with honor. Uh, but the reason why I explained the nexus between security and climate was my experience in uh, operational missions. And as you see on this picture, I've been deployed in Afghanistan several times, but I've also been involved in several other missions. And in Afghanistan, I have felt the impact of water shortages. And I saw the friction that it, it uh, raised amongst the population, a friction that the Taliban used to gain control over that population. In Mali, I saw how the droughts drove away the farmers, drove away the herders uh, to other regions that were already occupied by other herders and farmers, creating all kinds of tensions. And I saw how the people in the north of Mali had less and less perspective uh, and were forced to seek their fortune elsewhere and driven into the, ha the hands of, for instance, extremist parties. On the right top you see Iraq, where, I, where Daesh used water as a weapon, access to water. So villages only gained access to water when they uh, supported IS. Uh, so we see different dimensions of the impact of climate change in the different missions, which convinced me that climate change is also on the security side a game changer for this century a game changer that NATO needs to take very seriously. Uh, and I'm not the only one. I'm currently uh, heading a uh, network, it's called the IMCCS. And these are senior top level experts like me from all kinds of countries. More than 40 countries all over the world are already participating in this very young network, only two years existing. And they provide input, they provide best practices, uh, towards the research institutes that are also connected to this network, who translate that into analysis on what does climate change mean for security. And that's what we feed into NATO, what we feed into the EU, into the UN, to raise the awareness on the nexus between climate change and security. Uh, 
but we are not the only one who are calling for this. This slide shows uh, the Global Risk Perception Survey of the World Economic Forum. And these are not climate activists. These are scientists. These are economists. These are top-level uh, scientific researchers. And they assessed the top-level risks that we as a global world that we are facing together. And in the left row, you see the top risks that they uh, that they brought together by likelihood. So what's the most likely risk that we will be confronted with? On the right list, you see the top risk on impact. What are the most dangerous risks that we will be confronted with? And if you look at all the green dots on this uh, slide, you see that many of these risks are climate and climate change related. So also these experts, also the World Economic Forum, uh, in their risk assessment, see climate change as the game changer for the coming period. Now, where does this impact? Uh, if you look at the world, there are several different areas that are impacted mostly by climate change. Of course, there are the dry areas. Uh, we see the deserts only increasing, becoming larger and larger, and the inhabitable lands uh, or the habitable lands uh, decreasing. So they drive away uh, the farmers and, uh, and the herders and the people who live in those areas. We see coastal zones and delta areas that are confronted with sea level rise, that are confronted with more intense rainfalls, with melting glaciers, with all kinds of floodings. So they feel the impact of climate change as well. And especially the cities. Uh, in the world, two thirds of the whole population lives in urbanized areas. And we see mega cities coming up, and I will show you an example of that. And in these mega cities live tens of millions of people, twice the Netherlands in one city. And these cities are very vulnerable to climate change because they depend upon water, they depend on food supply. And one temperature degree, one degree temperature rise outside the city means two degrees temperature, temperature rise within the cities. So they are very vulnerable to these changes. And the last impact area I would like to mention are the rivers. Uh, because every country wants to hold on to its drinking water. They are building dams to control that. But the countries downstream, uh, they are affected by those activities. And we see that all over the world. At this moment, there are plans for additional 2,600 dams all over the world. And just imagine if a country upstream holds on to his water, builds dams, what, does mean, what that means for your country. That is a cause of friction, that's a cause of future conflicts. And the center part shows uh, another area of impact, uh, the final one, which is the melting Arctic. Uh, and this is also of importance to NATO, because the melting Arctic means that a completely new geopolitical arena is opening up. We see new trade routes coming, opening up over the north, we see all kinds of resources becoming acceptable, accessible on, uh, in that region. And we see Russia, China, and all kinds of countries planting flags in that region. So this is a region that NATO needs to take more seriously. Now, how does that impact and where does it impact? And here I will take you to the Sahel region, which is one of the uh, items uh, for this uh, uh, seminar. The Sahel region to me is kind of a canary in the coal mine. Uh, when the mine diggers in the, in the past, when they went into the mines, they took a canary with them. And when the canary died, they knew, oh, there are dangerous gases in these mines, so we need to get out. The canary was their warning light, was their indicator of danger. And the Sahel is our indicator of danger. The Sahel shows how climate change will impact and the Sahel shows how we will be confronted with those impacts and what these impacts are. If you look at the top uh, or the bottom left slide, you see that climate change leads to more food insecurity, meaning that countries like Mali, but all the Sahel region countries uh, are more and more becoming dependent upon uh, food supply from other parts of their country or from other countries, which makes them vulnerable. It takes away uh, the profession of many of the inhabitants who are farmers and herders who just cannot work there anymore. 
and you see that on the, on the right bottom uh, picture as well, the herders are driven away from the farmlands that they have been working in for centuries, but they cannot do that anymore because it's becoming too dry. And they have to move to other areas. But these areas are already occupied by other herders and farmers, so that gives frictions. <coughs> and many lose their occupation. Many cannot sustain their families anymore. So what do they do? They move. And that causes all kinds of migration flows. And we already see that happening. And at first they move to the cities. But in the cities they can hardly find work. Uh, so they become very susceptible for other influences. If you have to maintain your family, your children, and you cannot provide them with food on the table, then it's a very small step to go for the easy money. And the easy money can be found in organized crime, in the trafficking, <coughs> but also in extremist organization who offer you another uh, future. <coughs> and the Sahel region traditionally is a region with a lot of trading routes and also a lot of trafficking. <coughs> much of the human trafficking, much of the weapon trade, much of the drugs trafficking enters Europe through the Sahel region. So the, these are very powerful organized crime organizations and people who are losing their, uh, <coughs> their work in that region become very susceptible to those influences. So altogether, this is kind of a, a mix, a very dangerous mix of developments that's affecting that region, leads, leading to more friction and more conflicts. Already in my occupation, uh, the whole Northern Africa region, but also the Middle East region, was kind of a belt of instability where most of the conflicts appeared and where we often were deployed towards. And I think we can expect much more of that in the future. Now, how does that affect NATO? It affects NATO in different ways. <clears throat> Climate change, first of all, is also a direct threat. The sea level rise, for instance, affects the harbors, the naval harbors, affects the coastal facilities, radar stations, etc. On the picture you see the biggest naval base in the world, which is in the US. It's the Norfolk base. And already the fleet that's harbored there has to leave the harbor several times a year because of floodings. And this is only increasing. So it affects the operational readiness of units within NATO. A second change is the geopolitical change. I already mentioned the Arctic opening up, opening up a completely new geopolitical arena, but also think about the energy transition that's taking place, a very important development, but also changing geopolitical uh, uh, balances because it affects the position of OPEC countries, it affects the position of countries like Russia who depend whose economies depend upon the income of fossil fuels. And if we all make that transition to clean energies and become more independent of fossil fuels, their incomes will drop. And how will these countries adapt? How will they react? So that also changes the geopolitical balance in the world. A third element I would like to mention is climate change as kind of a peace inhibitor. And I mentioned the example in the Sahel, what we see is that climate change feeds the unrest in a region. It kind of fuels uh, conflicts in that region and thereby is becoming a destabilizing factor in many of those states, which means that, there will be, that the call upon the military to assist there will increase. Uh, and I think that NATO has a role to play here. NATO can use their intelligence to uh, assess the effects that will come out of climate change to provide early warning of ex uh, developments in extremism or in migration flows, etc. And NATO can help make these countries more resilient against these changes and thereby preventing uh, conflicts from occurring. A fourth element I would like to mention is the increasing risk of human security. And that, that has to do with the extreme weather events that we witness all over the world. Uh, we all saw the the wildfires in Australia, we saw in St. Martin in the Caribbean how a complete island was wiped away by extreme weather events and we see new records every year. We see more intense and more frequent natural disasters. And there is only one organization that can help in such circumstances and that's the military. 
So there will be an increased call upon the military to provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And also in that area, the security sector needs to adapt. A fifth element I would like to mention is the need to minimize the footprint. Also, the military has a responsibility when it comes to uh, reducing uh, emissions. In fact, the military in most countries is the largest single user of fossil fuels. The largest single fuel user, which means that they have a responsibility there. And of course, you don't want that to affect your operational readiness, but I think there are many opportunities here. And I'm involved in, in very interesting innovations where we look at how can we make a future military base that we built in a mission area, how can we make that self-sustaining? Producing its own energy, producing its own water, uh, maybe in the future even producing its own food. That would mean that all these large convoys with supplies will not be necessary anymore. So we can reduce not only the ecological footprint, but we can also reduce the logistical burden that's uh, an element of every mission. Logistics is the largest cost driver of a mission and is also the biggest vulnerability of a mission, which needs a lot of protection. So if you can reduce that, your operational readiness will increase. So also operationally, there are opportunities in looking for green technologies. And then, of course, there is the existential threat. <clears throat> what we see happening all over the world is that people are driven away from parts of countries that are becoming uninhabitable. We see islands that are threatened by sea level rise. The Marshall Islands are a famous example of this. These islands are threatened to disappear. A whole nation is, uh, is threatened by that change and uh, in the future might disappear, which also causes new frictions. People will have to move to other countries uh, and is an element of our future security environment. So climate change affects NATO in many, many ways, which does not make climate change a security problem, but I think climate change is also a security problem. And that's the discussion that I often miss. Uh, I don't see many security institutions recognizing the importance of climate change for their work. Uh, and that's what I am using my network for, to raise that awareness that climate change is really needs to be taken seriously. And that message is now coming across. People are picking it up. I see now NATO developing new policies on what does climate change mean for us? How should we adapt? How can we make our forces more resilient? How can we ensure that our soldiers are capable of working in all these circumstances, in all these extreme weather events and extreme heat? <clears throat> so new policies are developing, which is very promising. Also on the EU side, this is happening. If you look at the EU Green Deal, uh, the word security is not mentioned once. Uh, but now the EU is picking up on the topic and is also recognizing the security dimension of climate change and developing policies to deal with that. So I think the awareness is now raising. Uh, the subject of climate and security is put on the agenda. Uh, we have to take that to its next level, which is translating that into uh, adaptation. So how can we climate-proof NATO? That's the big question for the coming years. What role does NATO have to play uh, in a new changing environment? And I think there are many roles that NATO can play. And with that, I will conclude. I think that NATO can play a role in early warning with the very powerful intelligence services. If you recognize climate change as the root of conflict, the intelligence services need to look at this. And many are already doing that. And with that, they can provide early warning on changes that we can expect from climate change. I think NATO can work on embracing green technologies and be a platform for innovation. And I mentioned the example of that future base that we can build that becomes more self-sustaining. I think NATO absolutely has a role to play in countries to make them more resilient, especially in Northern Africa, in the Middle East. How can we help those countries to deal with the effects of climate change? Also on the security side, as part of a wider effort, uh, also with development projects and other projects. 
I think NATO has a role to play in dealing with the effects of climate change, with the humanitarian disasters, but also the conflicts that will occur as a result of climate change. So there are many roles that NATO needs to play and can play, uh, and it's good to see NATO picking that up. I've worked in NATO for 40 years, and in those 40 years, I have constantly seen NATO transforming, adapting to new circumstances. So I'm very faithful that NATO will be able to deal with this, uh, and I think it's very needed because this is the biggest challenge we are all facing this century. Thank you for your attention. And thank you so much, Tom Middeldorp, for this interesting speech. And while he makes his way here to the comfy chairs, uh, I would like to ask everyone in the coffee room if you have any questions for Tom Middeldorp, now is the time to uh, ask them. They will appear here on the screen so we can ask the questions live. Well, Tom Middeldorp, thank you so much for the inspiring speech. Please have a seat. Thank you. It's very interesting because you referred, of course, to how in the Netherlands the first response was when you mentioned climate change back in 2016. And the interesting thing is, well, is, if climate change is a security issue uh, or is it the scarcity of resources? Because the scarcity or the access to resources yeah. always has mm -hmm. been seen on one of the most important variables for the presence or absence of conflict. Yeah. So what role would you give climate change here? Is yeah. it an accelerator or is it an intervening variable or what's new? Well, that's a very good question because climate change as such is not the, the sole issue. Uh, you're completely right. There is a lack of resources all over the world, but there is another issue as well, which is the increasing world population. Uh, we now have a world population of about 7 billion people and the world population is expected to increase to 11 billion people in an average scenario, which means that we will get 50% additional people in the world. And they all need their smartphone, they all need water, they all need food, they all want a car. Uh, so there will be an increasing demand on water, on fuel, on energy, etc., etc., uh, which will only increase the, the call for resources. And meanwhile, the resources are depleting. Uh, we, uh, you know the, the, uh, uh, the day in the year that we have kind of used all the resources that the world can produce in one year is now moving backwards towards the 1st of August, I believe. So in August we have used, we have used up all the resources that the world can produce in one year. So as of August, the last part of the year, we are um, depleting our resources. We are taking away our reserves. And we see that because, for instance, the groundwater levels are dropping, the rivers are running dry. Uh, so we are, we are running out of world. Uh, so we really need to change. We need to, need to look for new ways of producing water, new ways of producing food, if we really want to deal with this. Yeah. And it's, it's not just climate change. Interesting, the choice of words, because you say we, of course. Uh, the issue is, and it was already mentioned briefly in the keynote speech by uh, Chantal de Oude, that of course, NATO and a lot of international organizations, our institutional structures are centered around nation states. However, in dealing with new threats, whether it's climate change or disruptive technologies or cyber, these threats, they don't really, you know, no. care about our institutional structure and our compartmentalized political structure. So um, the question, of course, when it comes to tackling this issue uh, in particular, would that mean that the political domain of NATO increased? And this was something that uh, got back in the question several times, like, do we increase the political domain of NATO? Uh, is it no longer purely military? Is there a risk of securitization, for example? Uh, well, I certainly don't want to securitize the climate change issue, uh, but I do say that it is also a matter of security and that NATO also has a role to play, but as one of many players. Uh, so what NATO, I think, needs to do is to seek the cooperation with these other players. And the EU, of course, is a very important one. Uh, the EU has very, very different means. They have a lot of money on the development side, they have economic means, they have uh, all kinds of different means. And NATO can complement that with the security dimension of it. And together they can help uh, this whole unstable region in Northern Africa and Middle East to become more resilient against these changes. We cannot be hi hide behind our dikes. We cannot do that. Because, uh, as you said, climate change knows no boundaries. It will come towards us. 
uh, and we can protect ourselves as much as we want, but we will be affected by what's happening in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia. So we need to look at this more globally. Yeah. And when it comes to, because of course NATO and also the EU has some sort of shared values, so it's more easier, of course, to, to, to find like-minded nation to tackle this, this, this issue. Uh, but still on that matter, uh, Pelle Ram, uh, thank you for your question. He asked, well, does this also mean that we have to wheel and deal with nation states in the Sahel who hold entirely different values? And maybe have even different priorities when it comes to, you know, the, 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 the access to resources and the importance of tackling this problem. Yeah, well, we have to deal with what is there. Uh, and of course, nation states are a given, are a given fact. We cannot deny that and we cannot run programs that these states will not accept. So we have to find solutions in helping these countries, in helping these nation states to deal with it. And I think organizations, not only NATO, but also EU and, and the UN, uh, they can help doing that. Uh, they can help build programs that, uh, yeah, that you build in such a way that these countries are not forced but are uh, stimulated to, uh, to embrace that. Uh, and, and I think these countries, uh, I've, I've spoken in many, with many of the leaders of these countries, they really feel the change that's coming. They feel the impact of climate change already. So they are very open for help on that area. Yeah, and we also noticed by the question that's very interesting that everyone sort of feels this multi-layered uh, dimension of the problem. Uh, yeah. There's also a question that more relates to an, uh, NGOs. Uh, the question is from Laura. Thank you for asking uh, the question. And she is wondering, would you argue that climate protection related NGOs are overlooking the role of war related pollution? Well, I think it's even broader. Uh, I, I think what we need to do, is we need to breach the stovepipes. And uh, we are all looking, uh, I'm as a military, I looked through the security straw towards an area and others are looking through an NGO straw with all their own agendas. Uh, what we need to do is breach that and uh, make it a more collaborative effort. And I think we have made big steps uh, during the last 10 years doing that. Uh, the whole 3D approach that we used in the Netherlands is an example of this, where we combine uh, development, diplomacy and defense <coughs> in an orchestrated effort. And that's also something that the EU is doing on a wider scale. And that's what really is needed, uh, including the cooperation with NGOs, including the cooperation with, with companies who operate in those areas. So we need kind of an ecosystem approach. Well, there's also very, uh, you just saw, I think the viewers at home just saw the cartoon. So uh, it, the multi-layered uh, issue is being addressed also in the cartoonish style of way. Um, there's also a question by uh, Hugo Rufino Marquez, which is, I think, more on a strategic level, but really Dutch also touch upon this question about, you know, countries with different shared values, but however, with a growing importance on the international stage. And he was wondering, what is NATO's concern about a growing Chinese predominance in Africa? Because if you speak about the Sahel, you have to, of course, also deal with China. Yeah, I think in general, uh, and that comes back to your first question, we, will, we are facing a, a increasing shortages in all kinds of resources. So there is a run for resources. And that's what China is also doing. Uh, China is investing a lot of money, not only in Africa, in all continents, also in the Netherlands. Uh, to, uh, to gain access to knowledge, to gain access to resources in a very peaceful way. They buy their way in. Um, but in the future, uh, when resources become shorter and shorter, uh, it will become a cause of friction. Uh, and in the past, many world wars have been fought over oil and access to oil. In the future, wars might be fought over access to rare minerals, minerals that are needed for our batteries or access to water because water is also becoming a scarcity. So I see uh, uh, lacking resources and the run for resources as a future cause of conflict. And as for a concluding question, because we're already running out of time, like 10 minutes, they just fly by, of course. Uh, I was just wondering more, uh, since 2016, when you first addressed climate change and you were dubbed the Green General, yeah. do you see a change in uh, posture or composure, uh, both in the Netherlands and NATO towards climate change as an issue? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, when in 2016, it was really a, a left-wing topic. Uh, the green parties, they did climate change, and uh, the right-wing parties, they did security. I think we are all now recognizing that both security and climate change are topics that affect all of us. Left or right, it doesn't matter, it affects us, so we need to deal with it. And that recognition is now taking place.
Uh, and I see now that, uh, for instance, in our, in our government in the Netherlands, it's becoming a very important part of the agreements that governments are making at this moment. Four years ago, that wasn't the case. Now it is the case. So something is changing and it needs to change uh, rapidly because my children will be confronted with these effects. And that's why I do this. Uh, I want to help minimizing uh, the effects of what we have caused as industrialized countries. Uh, the problem that we have caused. And I hope we can find answers to deal with it. And I think many of the answers can be found. Well, thank you so much, both for your speech and of course uh, your willingness to sit here and answer some questions from the audience. Uh, Tom Middendorp, uh, of course, we go now to the second part of our panel. So I would like to invite Sofia Ugwu uh, here uh, into the chair. Uh, and we will be joined as well by Miriam van Rijsen. Uh, but first, please, Sophia, take your seat. She's a founder and chair of the Center for African Justice, Peace and Human Rights. And with us uh, through a digital connection will be Miriam van Rijsen. She's an expert in migration, international cooperation and a professor in international relations at Tilburg University and also head of the European External Programme with Africa. So these titles in the international field are always a mouthful. Welcome, Sophia, so happy you can Thank make you. it. Before we start um, start off this panel, I would like to uh, address everyone, uh, the viewers. There has been a poll set up in the coffee room. Uh, later, we'll we look at the results because they will appear here uh, on the screen. But if you have not yet uh, conducted the poll, please do so because we can use that for an input in our discussion. Well. We started out this conference with a keynote speech on gender in international security. Um, my first question to you is, why would you say from your experience and your professional view, why is the role of women so essential when it comes to peace and security? Thank you very much for the question. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a very good question uh, because the role of women in peace and security seem to be um, underestimated. Women are seen, often seen as victims during conflict and that uh, overweighs the impact that they make in their communities in bringing back peace. And um, I, think, I think that's why the question is very important. So um, your question is why is it essential or why, why is it important that women have to play these roles? During conflicts, women, women generally provide care to the children, the elderly, and they tend to know a lot about the environment. So women, they are close to the environment. They know the good guys and the bad guys. Women have information about their communities more than almost anyone else. So. Because of that, it's easier for women to know the roots, the actual cause of the conflict, which is not really what we see on the news or what the public might know about. And that way, they have easy ways of providing solution to those problems than people who are from outside. So now, uh, women are peacemakers. Women are life givers and they are builders. So people who give life, they find it difficult to take life. Yes, and the implication now is that because women give life, they are more apt to protect life. That's why in every community you find that women play essential roles in trying to prevent conflict before it actually happens. They try to um, use other means of conflict resolution to sustain and maintain peace. So they, they, they go into the, the preventive measures, you know, instead of reacting to the conflict when it has happened. So women try to prevent conflict, build peace and maintain peace within their communities. When it comes to the continent of Africa, women, uh, females are often also weaponized actually uh, during these conflicts uh, by, of course, sex the, use, the widespread use of sexual violence actually as a tool to disrupt, you know, the, the, the fabric of society. What would you say are the so-called blind spots for international organizations, not only NATO, but also UN uh, and the EU when it comes to these issues? 
I think that um, the, the, the first thing that I may have to do is to correct the impression it's not really uh, for Africa or in Africa or within Africa that uh, women are weaponized during conflict. All over the world, uh, women are weaponized during conflict. We saw that happen during the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. We saw that happen uh, when the, uh, in the, during that conflict, uh, women were used uh, as uh, rape and sexual violence was actually used as a weapon of war. And um, it's happened so massively. And we, we, we saw that happen in Colombia. We saw that in Afghanistan, in Syria. A lot of places women are weaponized. So that uh, handles the, the first arm, which uh, is an indication that it should not just be with respect to Africa, but the whole world. And now, uh, talking about the blind spots, or what I think look like the blind spots, the first thing to do is to also recognize that the organizations that you mentioned, for instance, NATO or the United Nations, they have been well commended for some positive steps that they have taken. For instance, uh, the United Nations Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security um, tried to recognize the role of women in peace and security, as well as um, enhance or increase uh, the knowledge or make it more essential that women have roles or should be allowed to participate in peace building. And uh, for instance, for NATO too, uh, they are well uh, commended, you know, uh, in research and everywhere regarding the, the, the three pillars of integrity, inclusiveness, and uh, 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 they try to, to use um, more gender-friendly languages, and they try to um, create more opportunities for women. So these are some positive steps that these institutions that you have mentioned have uh, taken. Now, when you now leave those sites to go to what the things that seem like the blind spot, and what may be the future challenges. You can, you can talk about something that uh, I, I, I call um, shifting of the agenda or balancing of the agenda. So um, somehow the, uh, the institutions or most organizations, they tend to take a reactive approach to conflict. And what this means is that we wait until the conflict happens, then we react to it. So, but when you when you tend towards the reactive, the, the preventive approach, which is the opposite of the reactive approach, what we should focus more on is trying to prevent the conflict from happening and not wait until it happens, then we react to it. It's a bit difficult. That's why I said it's either we shift the approach, we shift the agenda, or we balance the agenda. Uh, the reason that this recommendation is made, for instance, uh, uh, in one of his articles, um, Jonathan Rosen stated that, uh, he, I think, I, if I remember correctly, there was an image in the, in the, in the publication, and uh, the image was depicting or tried to um, insinuate that the whole world seems to be over-weaponized, and then peace or resources put into peace is underestimated. It's much more um, attention is paid to trying to react or respond to the conflict, getting the ammunition and all that, but now little resources, little investment is made towards preventing the conflict. So the question is, what is really better for us? Should we focus on things that will prevent conflict, should we focus on building long-term institutions that will pay attention to preventive measures for conflict? And that is where building peace and sustaining peace comes into play. So we should cultivate the culture of peace building and peace sustenance instead of, you know, um, looking the other way. Because where we don't do that, what actually happens is that now um, 
the problem that comes up when we continue to, to react to conflict is that at the end of the day, we may have to continue without and to react to conflict. So we, when the conflict happens, after that, we set up peace measures, and after that, again, the conflict happens again. So that's the routine that we are going to follow. But when we prevent it, we institutionalize preventing it, what happens is that you don't have First, uh, people that are forcefully displaced. You don't have now the spillover of refugees that affects, become a burden on countries and other individuals. Actually avoid some sort of like waterbed effect, yes. right? So conflict in the region doesn't have to be some sort of guacamole where you just ad hoc and reactive are responding. Yes. Uh, I think this is a good moment also to uh, introduce uh, Miriam from Reisen. She's with us through a digital connection. Welcome, Miriam. Hello, Diwitje. Hi, I was wondering, uh, well, from your perspective, uh, well, well, as Sophia mentioned, that we need to be less reactive, uh, less ad hoc. Uh, from your professional view, um, do you recognize this, the blind, the blind spots that she identified? Yes, I think she was uh, completely spot on. There's a lot of um, experience about the uh, power that women can use in um, peacekeeping, peace diplomacy, um, uh, before and during a conflict. And that is actually very well uh, documented. And yeah, I think that Sophia is also right, that uh, one of the reasons why rape is such an issue as a weapon of war is that it uh, exactly um, undermines the, the power that women uh, can play as peace builders. Um, after all, they are uh, the center of the community and often also the center of the people that are involved um, in the actual fighting, um, voluntary or not, uh, as their sons, their husbands, uh, their fathers. So in that sense, they really they really have um, a power, soft power, but very important power. And we have also seen that a very um, difficult conflict, like for instance in uh, Liberia, uh, finished when women... Um, had enough of it. And um, so, yeah, I think that uh, she was spot on. I'm just wondering, uh, actually, when it comes to well, focusing uh, on NATO, which, which of course traditionally is not much uh, involved in uh, that part of the content, but still, when discussing and was also with reference to the keynote speech, um, maybe if, if, if you focus on the more the narratives surrounding uh, certain uh, uh, security institutions, there is, of course, a sort of Cold War uh, inheritance, right? So the security narratives often revolve around deterrence, balance of power, etc. And when you're looking at these multi-layered problems, but also these multi-layered conflicts, uh, would you say, Miriam, that this is still an adequate you know, security frame to put the current challenges in perspective? Well, I think that we really have um a difficult challenge now, and I and I think that we have become more um, aware of this, in the sense that um, our post um, Cold War um, setup is really a very big dependency of Europe uh, on the United States, and it's still really very difficult to uh, see an effective NATO uh, in whatever form um, without that transatlantic alliance. But at the same time. Um, we have seen that Europe uh, has been undermined. Well, uh, the Trump years um, are just behind us, but, but we don't know what is exactly in front of us. And um, this collaboration with, uh, with Putin and the Russians and so on has really, um, well, um, put Europe in a very new situation. So it's a, really a challenge. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it is inevitable that Europe has uh, and formulates its own strategy. Also based, I would say, on a social concept and, and a peace concept that fits much better with European values. Um, but um, at the same time, realistically, Europe is still also very uh, dependent on the United States in kind of the um, yeah the the hard element of the um, um, of 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 the military strategy. So um, Europe is also not ready to go its own, and 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 it would also be um, in some sort of way risky to um, remove itself completely from that um, alliance with the United States. So it's kind of a, uh, 
a difficult moment, but it definitely is a moment where uh, Europe can and, and should really rethink what a, a security concept means for Europe, um, how that reflects its uh, um, its values of, um, of of a good society, a, a, a so social society, a peaceful society, the soft power experience that Europe, well, really has been the basis of its uh, existence and where it has a lot of experience. Um, so it also certainly is an opportunity. Well, thank you so much for this uh, uh, answer to the question. Uh, I was wondering if we could take a look at the poll that uh, the viewers at home have been filling out and if we can see it in the screen. Uh, if not, oh, here we, here it is. Okay, the, yes, the question, I can see it right now. What purpose should NATO primarily serve in Africa? And that really touches upon, you know, the, the questions we had earlier to Miriam, but also to you, Sophia, like if you want a comprehensive, preventive approach, is there also a role for NATO? Well, according to the viewers at home, 25% says it should be protecting human rights. The second, that's a really interesting one, uh, is balancing Chinese influence. That's even the bigger one, that's one third. Uh, 33%, so that's over one third, says all of the above, and 10% uh, says none of the above. So there, we're not in the clear what they do want. I think balancing Chinese influence is an interesting one, uh, Miriam. If you uh, see the, 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 the results of this poll, uh, we were just talking about this sort of like uh, Cold War uh, inheritance from NATO. Do you see it back in the poll, in the answers, or do you see something, well, when it comes to protecting human rights, that's of course an increase also of the political domain? Well, um, first of all, uh, I mean, protecting human rights it should always be part of a security approach and definitely uh, is one of the uh, core principles of the uh, European Union. Um, the question is, how do you address them? And are all of the current tools that NATO ha has the right ones to do so? But um, yeah, I mean, it seems obvious to me that uh, a security approach uh, absolutely has to be rooted in uh, human rights protection. Um, the um, uh, issue of balancing uh, Chinese uh, power, uh, yes, I mean, um, again, this is something that has uh, been changing very much. U Europe really had an approach of, of uh, uh, looking for uh, collaboration with uh, China, but we definitely see the um, competition. Uh, you were just speaking about Africa, Northern Africa, the Horn of Africa. Uh, there, the whole access to uh, Africa and, and, and the very strategic uh, interests that are related to that uh, are definitely at the root of a lot of problems that we see at the moment, and which, in my view, receive uh, not enough attention. There's a lot of focus on the threat from the east side in the neighborhood of uh, Europe, so um, Russia and, and, and the current problems in Ukraine and so on, understandably. But then the whole, um, well, southern Turkey and then uh, more south in, in uh, the Horn of Africa and Northern Africa really also should have much more uh, attention from Europe. And one of the problems there is that Euro Europe actually um, has not necessarily been a... Um, uh, protector of human rights. If you look at the whole situation in Libya and whatever, we have incredible problems where really uh, Europe also carries responsibility. So there, I mean, I go back to what Sophia said, you really need to have a much more comprehensive understanding of what constitutes a security concept that can work for uh, Europe. Yeah. There's also a very interesting uh, question. I think it's uh, perfect for you to answer, uh, Sophia, uh, from Sasha. And she was wondering, well, it actually also touches upon the comprehensive approach and, you know, uh, which organization can fulfill which role. Uh, Sasha was wondering, a wider applicable footprint of NATO in Africa would directly deteriorate the African Union's reputation and influence. Shouldn't we think about strengthening regional organization and authorities, Sophia? So where do you see on the African continent, where's the role actually for local uh, or, or national or even regional organizations? Um, of course, um, th that's a very good point. The reason being that um, NATO does not have 
as much uh, direct impact on Africa. So at the end of the day, um, the African Union, uh, through which uh, NATO, you know, uh, operates, uh, has most of these uh, uh, roles to play in terms of um, actual execution or something like that. And um, now, uh, for instance, according to, according to the question, you see that from the African Union, of course, there are other organizations, nonprofits existing down there in Africa. But when you look at the population of the region, which is um, estimated at over 1.2 billion people, you, you agree that a lot of work is required. So um, in as much as reasonable steps are being made by NATO at the regional level down there and even um, at the local community levels, it's almost like it's, it's never enough or it can never be enough. So. Um, there is a call for strengthening local organizations from the regional level, strengthening existing organizations and creating more organizations on the area of protecting human rights and also preventing conflict and promoting or building peace institutions. So would you say that actually involving the local, not only local communities, but also local NGOs and uh, local authorities, those are sort of a safeguard to avoid that, uh, you know, international organizations and their promises about protecting human rights becomes a paper tiger? Apparently so, because um, when, when, you, when you discuss subjects like this at the community level, you know, um, sometimes the, the real people who, who make the peace, like um, some of them are not even professionals. The real people who, who settle or resolve these conflicts, they might not even be professionals. They might not have opportunity to be on the platforms that we find ourselves now. So the challenge that um, seems to have always existed is the fact that we have the policy papers, but um, which might give or have or be translated into a different in a different way by the people on ground so the ability to marry the policy papers the resolutions with what is actually on on ground is very important is there a disconnect sometimes between more policy papers and frameworks and all these lovely sort of official speak but is there a problem with translating these good intentions on the ground Yes, when we talk about translation, maybe not literal translation. So um, well, implementation. Yes, yeah. in terms of the implementation, yes, because uh, for you, for there to be peace and justice, especially uh, where Africa and the continent and the culture is uh, concerned, sometimes you have to also um, translate or interpret justice and peace according to their beliefs, their cultures, their values and you know, what is obtainable there. So in as much as we have those policies and the resolutions, the work now begins from the regional level to look at the people for which these policies are written and now see what actually works for them. Yeah, so no one size fits all policy. Apparently. Very nice. We have another question from the audience uh, from Fleur. Thank you so much for uh, asking this question. And she was wondering, is there enough cooperation between NATO and these local regional organizations or is there room for improvement? So we were talking about, you know, the make sure it doesn't become a paper tiger. Where would you say is the biggest challenge? Where is the most room for improvement? Um. The question is like, um, is, the, is there a disconnect? Or, uh, I mean, is, is it like... What's the biggest disconnect, I would say, at this, uh, if I translate it correctly? Yes, yeah, so, so, so if I understood the question correctly, the, 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 the basic thing is that, you know, whatever that we have existing on ground may never be enough. So it's not something... We need continued efforts, consistent, you know, a long-term consistent efforts. And, you know, it's not something that we can just do like we talk about it today and um, it's all gone. <laughs> so <laughs> we, need a, we need a system that is es established for this reason and, you know, it continues to exist for the very purpose of actualizing it. So um, that's the basic thing. And then um, as far as uh, peace and security generally, 
is concerned. What I think is that um, the area that we need to do more work is the area of involving women. So we still need to do more work. We need to create more uh, opportunities for women to participate in the peace and security architecture. We need to, we need to um, have a lot of capacity building for women, women that are already in the system and women that want to join. So we need to build their capacity. We need to train them. We need to teach them what to do. We need to, we need to empower them. And another thing that is important or necessary is um, we, need to, um, we need to tell the stories of women that have participated successfully in peace and security process. Because the truth is, as far as African continent is concerned, for instance, not just Africa, but we know little or nothing about the women that have played these roles in the past. We need to read about them, we need to study them, we need to research them, we need to honor them. That's where younger women are motivated to throw the same line, to go the same way, you know, to, to, to dedicate their lives or their careers to, to this. And that way uh, we have more women represented. But when uh, women are not given the opportunity and the little women that are given the opportunity uh, perform well, you know, uh, whether formally or informally, like the, the case of Africa, most of the women that have um, participated in building peace, they almost did that informally because um, they never had the platforms to, to formally uh, participate. So at the end of the day, the point is we need to announce them, we need to talk about them, we need to, we need to honor them and that's where we inspire and motivate younger African women or younger women to, to, to join forces for uh, peace and security agendas. I was wondering, uh, Miriam, listening to this, uh, to what Sophia said, hey, and, and also the need for this comprehensive approach, being more preventive, also do not, do not overlook women because they're 50% of the population on average, so it would be nice to have them included as well in the peace pro process. I was wondering, uh, in your professional opinion, um, looking at the several uh, developments right now going on in the continent of Africa, you know, several conflicts popping up here and there, do you perceive these as a threat to international security actually as a whole? And actually, can we afford this non-comprehensive approach when it comes to Africa? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I'm uh, certainly very uh, concerned about uh, the current uh, conflict uh, in this ring, uh, particularly uh, in the Horn. So I'm speaking of uh, Ethiopia uh, with um, a potential um, possibility to really uh, expand very realistically to involve uh, Sudan and uh, Egypt. Uh, of course, Djibouti is there, Somalia, and then uh, all the way on to um, Libya. So this is definitely something uh, that needs um, our attention. And where, I mean, going back to the previous question, we can see that the African Union uh, simply just isn't able to play uh, the role that it uh, that it probably um, should. Um, for some time, the position of the European Union uh, and also the US has been uh, uh, African solutions for African problems, which uh, I think is the right way uh, completely. But there are many people now from that region who are saying, we know that the African Union cannot uh, solve this problem. Uh, the leadership is actually implicated in it. The um, seat of the African Union is in Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa is really part of this conflict. So um, that is the, that's, that's the situation. And that really puts uh, pressure on, uh, on, on the US and, and, and the European Union to take a much uh, greater lead uh, there. So I would say, although I do really agree with um, the fact that you have to have uh, peace building uh, involving communities and the power of communities and, and, and that women have a specific role to play, I also think that we can't be naive and that there are really um, big players here um, uh, who are defending their interests. And uh, we also have to have an approach uh, to address those. Well, thank you. Well, this 15 minutes has actually flown by. We're actually through all uh, through our time and there's still uh, one minute left. So I was wondering, 
Sophia, listening to what Miriam just said, Heather, she's concerned about some developments. Uh, there's also some insecurity about which role is for the EU, which role is for NATO. Is the African Union strong enough? What would you say is needed on the short term? We've been talking a lot about the long term and the preventive measures. Is there also something you would say, well, this is something that we should and can tackle in the short term? Um, that's, that, that's a bit of a difficult question because, um, well, short-term short -term, uh, roles, short-term roles, of course, it's going to solve, solve the problem at hand. You know, I'm not so much of an advocate of short-term assignments or short-term uh, agendas. They are very well, of course, but my, my worry is the, the conflict that she mentioned in Ethiopia is not the first conflict in Africa. No. It's not also the first conflict in the world. So um, from the experiences that we have gained of the things that caused this conflict, the possible signs, you know, the things that, the warning signs that this conflict might happen, the time of the happening of the conflict, and now the time after the conflict, post-conflict. So the, it's a long-term so, issue, you say, so you so, we're already looking too much at the short term. We have, yeah. we have perhaps done a lot on the short term, and if we're still where we are at this time, I think that it's important to start building something of a long term that will bring the problem to a stop or near its end. I think it's a wonderful thought to actually end this panel. Thank you so much, Sophia, for attending live. I think it's really nice to have a lively conversation with actual people sitting in the chair. So thank you so much. We'll be having a short coffee break. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, enjoy the cartoon uh, on the Arctic opening up. That will be our next panel and we'll kick off at 11 o'clock. And as you can see also, well, not only the church bells are ringing, so it's definitely time for coffee, but also uh, the cartoonist is really busy with his general cartoon. So please enjoy your coffee, uh, make sure you debate each other in the coffee room and we'll see each other back here in a quarter of an hour. <laughs>